question that I, I have to clear up. Uh, one of the things that's made me laugh and also scream since the trials is the amount of, well, it's great, the amount of press you've gotten for, for running, uh, uh, making Team USA in your first marathon. But what I think mm. is really funny is, is how some of the non-running media kind of made it sound like- I had never run before. Like yeah. I was reading the People Magazine, the headlines in front of me, woman 25 makes history by qualifying for Olympics in first ever marathon attempt. And then nowhere in there they like any of your critics. She's a professional runner. I know, and a lot, it, that definitely, like, I thought it was very funny because they really took the whole, like, she's a barista thing and just kind of went with it. And so, like, right. amongst our, our friends, it was kind of this joke of, like, oh, yeah, she'd take a two-hour coffee break and just qualify for the Olympics. But, yeah, it's, like, I think a lot, it's, it's a much uh, more buzzworthy article mm -hmm. title rather than, like, oh, yeah, professional marathoner or, or professional runner who's dedicated her life to this thing qualifies for the Olympics. And so, right. Yeah, hey, <laughs> the backstory is no as fun. Sport, any notoriety for the sport is a good thing, and it has certainly mm -hmm. helped you gain quite a big following uh, in running mm -hmm. circles and beyond, which has got to be great. Yeah, yeah, it's been really fun. And yeah, if anything, it's like, I mean, the marathoning doesn't get a whole lot of press and track even less so. So it's like any any news we can get is is mm -hmm. something, even if it's a little bit skewed, if it's a little bit weird. Um yeah, I think it helps the sport overall. Well, I, want, I want to talk about uh, some of the kind of truths from that article. First, you, you were a barista, but that has, that has mm -hmm. come to an end with this pandemic. Do right? you miss it? Yes. Yeah, I do. I miss, um, if anything, it's really nice having like a, a job to go to where you don't have to necessarily think about running 24 hours a day. And like my coworkers didn't run. They really didn't understand running at all or like what it meant that I was a pro runner. They thought it was just kind of funny. So like, it's nice having that just because like being a pro athlete, it can be kind of like all encompassing sometimes. And you just like need to have a space to be able to get away from it and like talk about other stuff once in a while. Do you find yourself making really great coffee drinks for, I know your sisters, your roommate or your family, are you, are you, are you mm -hmm. the caffeine now at home? Oh, yeah, I have a horrible, horrible caffeine problem. Um, but yeah, uh, we've actually got an espresso machine back in Boston. So it's really fun getting to practice on that um, and work on it. My latte art is really horrible. But like I can make a very good like cortado or cappuccino. So hopefully someday I'll be able to open my own coffee shop. <laughs> Um, the other, the other big, the other truth in that article is, of course, it was your first marathon, regardless mm -hmm. of the fact that you'd run a 110 half, you know, have, have some NCAA championships under your belt, but you still did not come into that race two months ago, or two months ago, thinking that a top three finish was very likely, mm -hmm. right? I, I read that you called it a moon mm -hmm. shot, top 10 or a 20 would have been great. So mm -hmm. really on a scale of one to 10, how confident were you that, that you were going to have this kind of day? <laughs> Negative five. Um, <laughs> Really going into that race the day before, um, I don't want to make it sound like I had no confidence in myself. I, I was feeling pretty good. The buildup had been okay. Not great. Um, truthfully, I had one of the worst workouts of my life, like the week before, um, and basically told my coach, like, I don't know if I can actually finish 26 miles. He's like, you're being dumb. You definitely can finish this. But, um, John, my coach had basically said the day before, like, okay, like, your best day, you'll, you could get third, your worst day, probably like 15th. And so it was somewhere in that range that I figured. Um, and then I think part of what saved me is that the pack stayed together for such a long time. And I like, I was still just like, okay, like, if I just stay with this pack, I'll finish somewhere between third and 15th, like, just keep going. And then when we when it started to break up, it was like, okay, now you're just in it. But yeah, I couldn't have even imagined how that day was going to turn out. It was yeah, it was really wild. <laughs> Let's talk about that move because you and Alephine kind of went for it. I think it was around mile mile 22. Was there any conversation there? Was it sort of an unspoken, here we go? And 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 how did you feel when you made it? Do you think, okay, I, I've got this under my belt? Yeah, I guess when we started to break, at, it, it was like right around mile 19 or 20 is when um, we were going up like a little hill and the rest of the field just kind of fell back. And then I realized I was at the front and Alphine was right off my shoulder. And then she took over and really started to push. And so it was like, okay, like, this is the move. Just go with it. And I truthfully figured that the rest of the field would speed up with us. And then when it became apparent at 2021, 
um, that it wasn't, it was just like, okay, like let's work together now. So then there was like communication between the two of us of like, okay, like, keep pushing. She was like, stay with me, stay right on me. Anytime I started to fall back. So I appreciate that so much from her. Cause like, she's a veteran marathoner that I look up to enormously. So to have her there, like pushing me on and helping me because I, I'd never run further than 24 miles yeah. before that race. So I was like, okay, we're just in it. <laughs> and, and you guys had run, run together out in Flagstaff. You had, you, you were pretty mm-hmm. good friends from the end of the race, right? Yeah, yeah. So Alphine runs for for NAZ or Nas Elite. Um, and we've gotten the chance to train quite a bit together because I've been going out to Flagstaff basically once or twice a year since I was about like 18, 19 years old. So um, she's just like part of just like the wonderful community that's out in Flag and so many people run together and she's been um, just a, a good like supportive person throughout my running career. So it was really special to get to have that with her. Some of the people in the comments were, were laughing when you said Little Hill at, at 19, because as you probably know pretty well, there were not very many Little Hills on, on the course. And you had not come here and, and done a test run. Mm-hmm. So when you were out there, what was what was your impression of the course? And then, of course, the, the crowd support, did that help balance out the hills at all? Yeah, I guess for for me, I'm def- definitely a strength runner. Like I, I really thrive off of those just like grinding hard courses. And I know um, my Saucony teammate, Jared Ward had basically said like, Oh, this is the cross country version of the marathon. I was like, sweet, I'm great at cross country. So um, I think it that day definitely benefited me. I think if it had been a really flat, fast course, it would have been a very different story. So I even though it was very hard, it was very windy. I was trying to just use every possible, like, like trying to keep in mind, like, okay, like this is what you're made for. Like you can do this. Like if not on this course, then what other course would you be doing it? So um, I actually really appreciated it, but yeah, you guys at the Atlantic track club, that course was sadistic. (laughs) (laughs) We we, we weren't thinking sadistically when we made it. We we tried to make it as flat as possible, but you know. Yeah. uh, That's what I heard that it was changed then. um, And especially those last couple miles, but I don't know that one last hill right up. Is it like your town hall or something? The one with the gold dome. That's the state capital. Yeah. The state capitol. Yeah, that was absolutely killer. The only thing that kept me going was the fact that it was like a golden dome and I just associated it with Notre Dame. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good way to think of it. We actually had a hill after that that was worse. And we took it out because we had just we had run the course so many times and realized we just couldn't put people through that. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I want to talk about what the next 24 hours, uh, what, what did you do in the next 24 hours after the race? Like, how do you celebrate? This in, in the okay. Spot? So I actually didn't physically sleep for like 48 hours after that race. Um, part of it was just like the race was fairly late in the day, I guess, for a marathon. So like I didn't even get through media, like the press, the press, drug testing. They tested our shoes afterwards. So I didn't even get like away from like that finish line area until probably I want to say like four or something. And then we, we get back was at the hotel. And then my sister actually was running um, in the unsanctioned take the bridge race over Mm -hmm. at the Georgia beer garden. So I was like still in my uniform, had my bib on and everything. So we book it over to there to go watch her. And then we're hanging out at the Georgia beer garden for till probably midnight or so and then I was starting to like kind of crash so we headed back to the hotel but I just couldn't sleep um I was still like pretty wired so I ended up just like talking with my roommate who came back later like all night and then had to be up at six anyway to um we started off the the marathon the next morning and then just like cruised through that whole day so it was a a little bit of a fever dream after that race (laughs) Uh, last night, Jake Riley threw some shade at Georgia Barbecue. You went to Georgia Beer Garden. Mm-hmm. What, are, what are your impressions of Georgia's beer scene? Okay, that Georgia Beer Garden was wonderful. I think we actually like cleared the place out yeah. because the so Tracksmith was having like their big after party there, um, mm-hmm. and it was funny. They had like a big chalkboard of like the 24 different beers that they had on tap. And every time like they ran out of one, they have to like take the big eraser and like erase it and everybody cheers. And I literally think we cleared it out that night. So <laughs> it was, it was a fun little challenge. <laughs> people know who you were. Were people coming up to you and congratulating you? 
Yeah. So actually the, the funny thing was because my sister was racing, I gave her my, my race bib since I'd still had it on. And then I had my backpack with like the American flag and my medal. Mm -hmm. And so after her race, which she won, I gave her the medal and the flag to wear around and she had my bib. So everybody was thinking that she was me. So a lot of more people were actually congratulating her. And then I was kind of like off in the corner with my friends, like eating a burger, having beer and kind of like staying a little bit more low key. She's definitely the more uh, gregarious of the two of us. So I let her take some of the, t some of the heat. Well, I, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you had a good running experience here because I know when you came to run Peachtree in the summer, you left mm -hmm. here with, with, uh, with not the kind of memento you wanted to leave here with. You, you were injured mm -hmm. when you left Peachtree, right? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, um, I, I was like hobbling through the, the Atlanta airport the last time I was coming out. Um, I really hurt my hip again. And I was definitely wondering at that point whether or not like I was still going to be able to do it because after, after having the surgery the year before, um, having like that, I guess like relapse or like injuring it again, that could have kind of like spelled the end of my career. And luckily my, my college coach who I'm still very close with kind of talked some sense into me, but yeah, I was, I was on crutches after that race and missed most of the summer. Um, and really grateful that I was able to like kind of get back on the horse and, and get into marathon training, which was ultimately a lot healthier for me than the training that I was doing leading into Peachtree. How did you ease into that marathon training? Because a hip injury could, you know, obviously that can, that can flare up mm -hmm. pretty quickly if you jump back into it too, too quickly. What is, what was your process for, for getting back to healthy running? Um, so to get past the initial part of the injury, the, I was just fully on crutches for two weeks, no cross training, like not even walking that much because from coming off of surgery, I kind of realized that I have a bad habit when I'm cross training of like pushing way too hard. So I was like, okay, like I really just want this to heal. I want it to settle down and I need to just like take this seriously. So yeah, I didn't do anything fitness wise for probably the better part of like three, four weeks. Um, and then just got back into easy mileage and we kind of realized that it was these really intense workouts that were breaking me down. And so kind of just focusing on mileage, long tempos, threshold stuff, things that are like moderately hard, but just kind of like grind you down slowly rather than like those super fast track workouts. Um, that ultimately was what kind of worked better for my body and I can maintain a much higher mileage. Um, I think like my body stays healthy on mileage that's higher than normal for most people. My golden zone is kind of like a hundred to 110 and then 120 for the, for the full marathon build. Um, so as long as I'm doing moderate workouts and not pushing too hard in that sense, I can push pretty hard on the mileage. I want to talk about Tokyo for, for a little bit, because obviously the, the celebration didn't last as long mm -hmm. as I think we all would have wanted it to with the, the mm -hmm. announcement. You were, you were an early proponent of, of postponing the games. I, I mm -hmm. imagine bittersweet position for you to take yeah it was it was definitely hard and it was definitely that like as things started to shut down that like slow horrible realization that like yeah this is definitely not going to be the right thing to do and I was frankly pretty surprised how long the IOC held out on making that decision just mm -hmm. because um the overall like the safety of athletes and the ability for athletes to qualify um, when that's impeded, you're kind of compromising what the games are about. And like, I think Jake Riley put it better than just about anyone when he's like, none of us want like the experience to be like, the, the, it is, I think yep. what he said. Um, and I, I fully agreed with that is like, if we're going to have the Olympics, we want people to be able to go watch. We want every country to be able to be involved. We want everyone to have a fair and equal chance to qualify for them. So that was just, there was no way it was going to be able to happen this summer. And I, I just felt like I, having already had the luxury of qualifying, which a lot of other runners didn't, I kind of needed to take a stand early on it. And you're in, you, we, I know you for a while, your Instagram profile said pending Olympian, but yeah, I think the decision has been made. You're, you're going in 2021. Yes. Yes. Um, that was kind of a terrifying 10 days when mm -hmm. USATF was still like on the fence about it. And I think it probably came down to 
just the fact of how uh, how difficult it is to throw an Olympic trials marathon. Like, frankly, I'm pretty shocked that you guys were able to pull it off as seamlessly as you did. So uh, I think the prospect of having to run another one of those was pretty terrifying for them. So they're like, yeah, it's fine. It's just you guys go. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not planning on, on putting on another one. I think we're still, we're still recovering in a different way than you guys. <laughs> Six months uh, preparing for the games is a lot different than 18, 18 months. How does your how does your running life change now that you have a year and a half to get ready for mm -hmm. the Olympics? Frankly, for me, because I am like because I am only twenty five and because it I have only run one of these, it actually is a really cool um, opportunity for me. Just because it gives me the chance to get more training under my belt. Um, because really, I did only have like eight months or so of healthy running leading into the trials. And so if I get the chance to get more mileage, more workouts, and then hopefully, fingers crossed, to run another marathon um, before then, like one of the fall majors, that would actually be a really good chance for me to learn and prepare for the games as best I can. So if anything, I think it kind of benefits those of us that are already in because now we can just like fully like work backwards and devote ourselves over the next year and a half to getting as ready as we can for when we get to Japan. If racing comes back and it, and it will, will you, will you line up for a marathon between now and then? Yes, definitely. Um, the plan is one of the American majors in the fall. We haven't decided, sorry, we haven't decided which one yet, but um, yeah, we're just hoping that things are kind of back to normal by then. Um, and everybody's healthy. So whether it's a pro only field, whether they're able to run them in full, like definitely would be trying to do one in the fall. I have to ask about something you've, you've been vocal about because a couple of high school coaches have reached out to me since, uh, since we announced that you were coming on. Uh, you, you talked about how you struggled with the eating disorders in high school and, and college and how some of that kind of marred the success of your college career. How important mm. was it for you to have such a big success, something parallel to what you did in college in this new chapter of your life? It was, it was really huge, yeah, to be able to have, like, gone through the work that I put in over the last four years since 2016 when I basically, like, self-destructed before I even made it to the line at the Olympic trials. Then um, to be able to go through all that, to get to the line in Atlanta and really feel like I was in a really healthy place mentally – um, and just like, frankly, a pretty different person than I was four years ago. And then to be able to like, have that success was huge. And just being able to have my family and my friends there who like, a lot of them were, I mean, all of them were there when I was at my absolute worst. So it was like, I think it really kind of came full circle. And just to like, 2016, the Olympics were the only thing I cared about. And this time around kind of realizing like, okay, like, this is fun, but it's almost like, there's a lot more than just this. And then to finally get it was like, wow, like, this is cool. What, what, what do you attribute to, to kind of turning things around in 2016? Is there any one thing that was like, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go in a different direction here. Um, yeah. Like friends and family who were able to have like really frank discussions with me that I like wasn't going down a healthy route. And then ultimately just like coming to the realization myself that I couldn't keep going like that. And that um, basically like, it was the realization that I wouldn't be able to run anymore and do the things that I loved if I kept going down the route that I was doing. So part of that was having to take an extended time away from running and really focus on mental health. Um, but ultimately it's kind of like with an injury or something like you have to be willing to put in the work and, and take the time that you need to get healthy before you try to like ramp back up. So it's the same with mental health as it is with your, with your physical health. I know so many, at least here in the Atlanta area, where we have a, a really great cross country and track and field uh, program in high school. You, you, you've gained a lot of fans and, and a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of the athletes who are out on the course really look up to you, and, and, and that message will resonate with them. So, so thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, on to on to some fun topics. I'm going to take some questions from uh, from the from the comments here in a second. But first, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about run fast, eat dough. I saw that on your Instagram <laughs> page. Is that real? And where can I buy it? Uh, no, um, unfortunately, that was a one day only April 1st sale. Um, no, I actually have had a lot of people reach out to me about that one. Um, my sister actually put together the, the cover of that one. I'm just the ideas woman. She's the graphic designer. So I don't know, maybe in the future, I feel like a lot of people have been like, 
oh my gosh, I really want you to write this book. I'm pretty sure it would be copyright infringement on Shalane Flanagan and Elise Gebecki. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I bake a lot. I like, I love doing, like, I've been quarantine baking a ton. So I don't know. Maybe someday we'll, we'll put out a baking book. But no, for anybody wondering, you cannot buy Run Fast Eat Dough. It's totally fake. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> do you have, like, a good, do you have a go-to recipe or any, anything you've made a lot since you've been quarantined? I've actually been perfecting my English muffin recipe, uh, which I've like, yeah, I really enjoy English muffins. And so that was something that I like wanted to learn how to get down. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try and like, I really want to start like making donuts more. Um, but I don't know, it might be one of those things where it's better when you just go buy it from a place. I'm trying donuts this weekend. I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Uh, it's the hot, it's the hot oil. It's the frying things is the nightmare. Yeah. I've fried, I've fried things before and my arms were just like totally burned. So I don't know if I'm willing to do that to myself. I think the Dutch oven is key. Like you have, a, you have to have a good Dutch oven, I think. Yeah. Right? We'll find out. Yeah. I'm gonna find out this weekend. It could be terrible. <laughs> I could burn my kitchen out. <laughs> um, I had a, a question from Chris in the comments. What's the, what would be the top song? On, and I see you're running on the treadmill a lot. What's the top mm -hmm. song on your, on your playlist right now? So I have been, one of my favorite artists is Abby the Nomad. And so I've been doing a lot off of his new release, um, Modern Trash. So yeah, he's got one called Silicon Valley that I've been like really, really enjoying. So yeah, probably, probably a lot of that. It's good running music. A similar question. What, uh, in this time where we all have a little more time to watch TV and read, what are you watching? What are you reading right now? Um... I hate to say how quickly I, I like binged through Tiger King because that's usually not my jam. Like I, I prefer like kind of like darker, grittier stuff. I've been um, doing the third season of Ozark right now. So yeah, Tiger King was a nice little like, yeah, sprinkle in there. Um, and then reading wise, I've been reading a ton um, just because I, I really do enjoy need reading. And so I'm uh I'm working my way through um, Infinite Jest right now, which is just massive. So it's taken me a really long time. And then um, I, I just read American Dirt, which was really good. I've, I know so many people who've started American Jest and not made it through. So, <laughs> uh, it, okay, that's like that's the joke is that you yeah. only ever make it halfway through and then you just talk about how you're reading it. So right. I guess I'm just becoming one of those people that I'll only ever make it 500 pages through it. <laughs> Um, a, a more, on a more serious note, a more running note, somebody asked in the in the comments what your number one build up workout was in the trials in the trials build up. So a big one that John had me do, um, we call them like float and push miles. So rather than doing just like a straight twelve mile tempo or something, we like take marathon pace and then it's like 10 seconds faster than that and 10 seconds slower than it. And you float 10 seconds slower and then you push. So alternating miles. Um, so it will be like, okay, you run like a 530 mile, then a 550 mile, 530 mile, 550 mile, and do that for 12 miles. And it kind of teaches your body to flush lactic acid and is really good because it like I think it kind of accurately mirrored like the pace changes that we had in Atlanta. So I really enjoyed that workout. Um, we would do that at, at 7,000 up in Flagstaff and we would come down sometimes um, cause I had been training at, in Flagstaff before the trial. So felt like that one was kind of like the, the one that really got me ready. Uh, Aaron in the comments is asking what a typical night of sleep looked like during, during the trials build up or during any marathon build up really. Okay, so I'm going to admit that I actually am a terrible sleeper. Like, I have really bad insomnia. So, like, a really good night of sleep for me is, like, eight hours or so. Uh, like, uh, truthfully, a really bad night might be, like, three or four hours. So um, I kind of just have to learn. Like, I've learned how to work with that. I've had that since college. Um, and, like, I'll take naps throughout the day if I don't sleep well. Um, sometimes it's about, like, if I sleep really badly the day before a workout, like we just have to push the workout because it's like, it's kind of a factor with me that like, I can't, I can't change necessarily, but yeah. So for anyone who's like, you have to sleep 12 hours a night to run a good marathon. It's like you, you make do with what your body, what your body gives you. 
Yeah, and if you like caffeine, I mean, you're, I mean, it's basically the same thing as sleep. Right? Well, that's the thing. It doesn't make a difference whether or not I drink caffeine. And like, I've tried that of like cutting out caffeine and I almost sleep worse then. So it's yeah. like, yeah, I think my body's just gotten so like, yeah, inured to the caffeine at this point. With, with no races on the horizon now and the marathon behind you, are, are you working out now? Or are, you, are you just running? And if you are working out, what's the typical kind of workout right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so everything's pretty um, kind of like loosey goosey right now. We um, we're just doing mileage. Um, I'm doing like some fart like workouts, tempos, but nothing really structured, I guess. Like I, I see a lot of people doing like trying to do like fast time trials and stuff or whatnot. And I'm like, oh, uh, like I just don't really feel the the drive right now to. do like virtual races or time trials and so we're kind of taking this as a nice like I don't know a time to really like enjoy running again and like I do love just running straight mileage um so like enjoying getting out like doing my 12 mile easy runs and stuff like that and then if I really feel the urge maybe like hop into like a longer fart lick or something but yeah it's truthfully it's really just kind of like working with the conditions right now because it's like I, I can't get on a track. I, I can't meet up with people to work out with. So, yeah, it's kind of just getting through this time. What's running like in, in Boston and Wisconsin? Has it changed a lot? I know Boston's a lot more dense than, than most big cities. You're running with the mask. Are there are lots of crowds mm -hmm. you have to avoid. Yeah, so one of the reasons why I ended up coming back to Wisconsin is just because it was so crowded in Boston, and there were – Basically, like anytime I would go out on the Charles River, which is where I do the majority of my runs, it's it was almost impossible to stay a safe dif distance away from people. Um, and I was just like not only worrying for my safety, but like of people around me, because like if I have something and I'm like unintentionally spreading it, like I don't want to be a part of that, want to stick to social distancing. So out in Wisconsin, we live in a much more rural area. And so it's like I can go out on farm roads and not see another person in a 14 mile run. So it's like, uh, it's just a lot logistically easier to train out here right now, but, um, we'll be heading back to Boston and yeah, I'll be running with a face mask. I've got a car, so I'll probably drive outside of the city a little bit, but yeah, just kind of working with the conditions that we've got. Uh, last question. Cause I know I've, I've got to let you go. Uh, mm -hmm. I, how eager are you for racing to come back? And, and has this, has this slowdown kind of, has it, has it changed your outlook on, on the sport at all? Um, I, I think after the trials, I was originally planning on doubling back pretty quickly and trying to do the track trials for the 10 K, not necessarily with the intention of making the team, but, uh, for the 10 K, but like just to get to do it. Um, and then when everything like slowed down and stopped, it was actually kind of a not not nice, I would say, because obviously this time kind of sucks for everybody. But it, I did kind of appreciate having that chance to like slow down, reflect. I'd been nursing a little bit of like a foot injury, so like being able to let that heal up and just take some time to like enjoy running for running's sake again. Because I feel like as a pro, you're always like looking to the next race, looking at the next thing. And right now, it's nice just being able to like, okay, I'm just gonna like chill just be like I don't have to feel like I'm like building up for some huge thing right away that being said I'm also like very 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 eager for racing to start up again again tree like it's all of these races that like are just such cool experiences for like, not only the pros but for everybody racing them so yeah I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the the world can kind of get back to a little bit more normal pretty quick here yeah i know that that all of us that that are fans of the sport and watch the sport after seeing your performance in february want to see more so we're